this Palm Sunday. We're ex- we welcome you to the invitation. We're excited you are here. It's a good day in the life of our church. We have a few announcements. Register your attendance, particularly if you are new. Good morning. Um, we want to know if you've been here, especially if you're new, so we can reach out to you. So if you would register your attendance. At 10 o'clock today, it's big goings on at the church. We have an Easter egg hunt, and we have a petting zoo, and we have three areas for the kids to hunt eggs. So we would love to have you out there. It's a sunny day, praise God, and it's not raining, so we're not hunting them in here. So life is good. Our God loves us and even sent us a beautiful day. Um, Holy Week is this week, y'all. It's a big week. Thursday is Maundy Thursday at 7 in the sanctuary. Good Friday is April the 7th, and it's at 7 also. And then Easter Sunday, you have four opportunities to worship. 6.30, two times at 8.45, and then at 10.55. We would love to have you all here on Easter Sunday. But to get you ready for Easter Sunday, you need to come to Maundy Thursday and Good Friday because our hearts need to be broken on those days so that we can celebrate our risen Christ. So we would love to have y'all at any and all of the services. One more announcement. We had a death in our family. Mickey Elliott passed away yesterday. His wife is Sally. The service will be a, a visitation will be Monday, I think, and they're having a graveside Tuesday in Trustville, Alabama, maybe. I can't remember. It's in Alabama. But anyway, there will be a visitation on Monday night, and so they'll be getting the information out to y'all on that. And where there's death, there's life. Hannah, that's usually standing up here, had her baby. So she has a little girl. She weighs six, six fourteen, and baby and mama are doing well. So we rejoice as we grieve. Our God is so good. If you would pray with me. It is right to praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. On this day, he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed as King of kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. Let these branches be for us signs of our victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our king and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And our scripture, our psalm is Psalm 118. I give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord that righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. As the band begins to play, if you would greet each other with the peace of Christ. Good morning. Let us stand and worship together.
the highest. We are so glad that we are worshiping with each other today. Uh, and you can be seated here for just a moment or two. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Hughes Milam, our staff parish relations committee chair, to come up for an announcement. Thank you, Smith. And good morning. As uh, well, first I wanted to remind you briefly how our appointment system, how our appointment system, connectional system works, especially those of you who may be new to the United Methodist Church. Our bishop, Sharma Lewis, and her cabinet work prayerfully together to appoint the 650. Uh, some odd uh, clergy to all of the Methodist churches in our Mississippi Methodist Conference. The goal, of course, is to provide the strongest spiritual leadership uh, to the United Methodist Church across the state of Mississippi. Our pastors are appointed annually and are actually subject to be moved on a yearly basis. We had not anticipated any changes in our clergy for next year. But unexpected changes do occur, and such is the case with our church this year. Bishop Lewis and the cabinet have asked our associate pastor, Smith Lilly, to make a move for the good of the conference, and he has dutifully responded yes to that request. As chair of the staff parish committee, I give thanks for the ministry of Smith Lilly, who is truly a servant leader among us. Later this spring, we will have an event to celebrate the time, the talent, and the spiritual leadership that Smith has given to us over the last seven and one half years. And to all of you, I encourage you to share your uh, ex uh, memories and express your appreciation to Smith and Jessica and their family for the time that they have been with us. Uh, also keep them in your prayers. The location to where they will be headed has not been announced because there's still many details uh, being worked out. Uh, uh, Bishop Lewis and the cabinet are working to complete the appointment process for next year and hopefully soon we'll be able to announce who our new associate pastor will be. Until that time, let us be in prayer together for that person who is to come in our church during this time of transition. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Hughes. Well, I won't say much today, or I can't say much today, but do let me say thank you to all of you. Um, I am deeply grateful for this church. Uh, this is the thing I've done longest in my life, as I think about it. Man, I wasn't going to do any of that. So <laughs> somebody tell a joke. Somebody got a knock-knock joke, something like that. Okay, we're good. Uh, I am deeply grateful for this place um, and all of you uh, and for your care for me uh, and my family. And uh, we will be able to say a lot more about that in the, coming, uh, in the coming days and weeks, but just let me tell you all first, thank you. Uh, I am uh, looking forward to telling you what I'll be doing next when I'm allowed to do that. As Hughes said, this wasn't an expected move, uh, but it was something that, when it came up, uh, made sense for the, the church, made sense for the kingdom of God, uh, made a lot of sense for me and my family, and I think it's going to be a great thing for this congregation as well. I will veil that in mystery until such a time as it will be revealed. But you all have my deep, deep gratitude, uh, and uh, I look forward to our next adventures together, uh, and you'll be hearing about more of that in our great, uh, wonderful, connectional church. One of the great things about being a Methodist and being a Methodist in Mississippi is that we are all tied together. We are all in ministry together, um, and that looks at different ways, different times, and different places. Um, but uh, we always will have that connection uh, as we do ministry together. And um, we'll, uh, we'll talk more about all of these things uh, in, the coming, in the coming days. That is way too much about me and a church service. Let's talk about the Bible and let's talk about Jesus this morning. Um, our gospel reading today is from Matthew 21 uh, and uh, beginning with verse 11. 
I invite you to stand with me as we read. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. You all may be seated. Who is this? That's the question that we come to at the very end of that gospel reading. Who is this? Is this now? That's a question that you could imagine being asked in uh, in other situations, in other scenarios. I called upon our need for a knock knock joke well, not just a few minutes ago. I mean, that's the premise of the whole joke, right? You all know what to say. Knock knock. Who's there? You don't say who is it, but that means the same thing, right? So you can imagine us asking this in a in a joking kind of way. Who who is this? There's an element of humor there. Of course, you've encountered uh, the question, who is this, in a different way, too. Whoever has read, like, a mystery novel, or do y'all like those, like, true crime podcasts? I know some of y'all love true crime podcasts, right? The whole thing is driven by the question of who done it, right? Uh, who are the people that, who is the person that we're dealing with here? We're asking the question, who is it? So the question, who is this, could encompass not only humor, but something about mystery, right? Something to be revealed. We genuinely want to find out who this person is. There's another way that I have experienced this question of who, who is this being asked. And you may have been, those of you who've been following the NCAA tournament, may experience this as well because every year right there's the there's the Cinderella team who had uh who had San Diego State in their in the finals none of you did right I bet even the biggest basketball fans you did who did fantastic Tom oh okay well that does make sense right so that was that wasn't really based on knowledge that was just based on sheer right bias right but you were right it turned you can be biased and right um I mean, it's me all the time. I'm biased and right. Uh, so there's a, so you may, or maybe you've watched a game, and all of a sudden this player that you didn't know about before starts, you know, knocking down threes, right and left, and you say, who is this, right? Uh, and so there could be an element in that question of this unexpected person or this unexpected team or this unexpected group coming out of nowhere, and we haven't known who they are or what they're about, and now look at what they're doing. There's also a way that you might ask that question of yourself, right? Um, if you, you might have gone through points in your life where you have to figure out who you really are. And so the question, who is it, could be applied to yourself, right? Discovering who you really are in this world and how it is that you'll live. And the question, who is it, in our Palm Sunday reading, uh, we have a little bit of all of those elements all attached together um, as Jesus enters in to Jerusalem. Right? There's an element of, of humor there. Uh, Jesus comes, and how does he enter into Jerusalem? He's riding on a donkey, right, or a colt, the foal of a donkey. And Matthew tells it in kind of this weird way where there's two of them, right? So if you go to, to verse 2, saying to them, he says, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her, right? Some of the other gospels tell it a little differently. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, uh, just say this, the Lord needs them. And now, I probably couldn't go to your houses and say, 
uh, I'd like your car, the Lord requires it, and you wouldn't ask some follow-up questions at least, right? But here, there's, it's, it's funny, right? And the way he has two of them, it's, you know, kind of drawing on this, uh, drawing on this, uh, this Old Testament prophecy from Zechariah that we'll talk about in a little bit, and Matthew is, it almost, it's, it's a, kind of funny scene in a lot of ways. He's coming in on both a donkey and a colt. I don't know if he has like one foot on one and one on the other or what, but um, it's a humorous scene, right? And it calls our attention to this question about who, who this man is, who this figure is. But there's a lot more than humor here. There is an element of mystery as we might encounter in the who, in the whodunit sort of question. Who is this person and what is he doing as he enters into Jerusalem? And loaded through this passage are, uh, are all of these different descriptions of Jesus' identity that are sort of swirling about. And as we read them, um, they're not, it's not altogether obvious what these things might mean. And I think even for someone who would have been watching this 2,000 years ago, the reason that they're applying these different titles and names to Jesus is because they're trying to figure out who this figure is and what he's about as he comes into Jerusalem. And so as we read, right, first uh, they come near Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, and he sends his disciples, uh, and then Jesus gives himself this title. He says that the Lord needs them, right? And then Matthew, explaining what's happening, calls on this prophecy from Zechariah, and he, and he describes Jesus as the king that is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. Then the crowd will give him a different title. They will call Jesus the son of David, right? David, the great king of Israel, maybe the best king of Israel. So calling on that different title. And then at the very end, we have yet another name that's given to Jesus, right? The, the crowds, as people ask this question, who is this? The crowds say, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So we have this question almost swirling around uh, the Matthew 11, right? And, and as in the scene as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, who exactly is it? He's the Lord, he's the King, he's the son of David, he's Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee. What does that all mean? Who is this? What is this mystery? Who done it and what's he doing right now? But there's also in that last title something, something, um, well, excuse me, but before we get to that, um, in, this, in this whole scene that Jesus is setting up as he enters into Jerusalem, Matthew tells us that it's to fulfill what had been spoken of in prophecy. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. What uh, Matthew was calling on there is a prophecy from uh, the book of Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah. And what's going on in Zechariah is... Uh, the question of how the people of Israel, who've been sent into exile in Babylon, right? That's sort of like modern-day Iraq. Like how they will get back into the land. And what will become of the temple that had been destroyed, right? When, when Israel was carried off into captivity. Will it be rebuilt? How will God's people, who are in a terrible situation, find their way out of it? And Zechariah brings this prophecy uh, that includes this image of a king that will vindicate Israel, right? That will, that will bring them back into the land, that will lead them in the way that they ought to be led. And he brings up this image of the king that will enter into Jerusalem riding on a colt or a donkey, right? Um, and which is the exact thing that David had done back in the day. So what's with this image? On the one hand, sometimes you'll hear people say something like this, you know, um, we expect a, a military leader, a king, to come riding in on a war horse, but Jesus instead rides in on a donkey. And this points to his humility. And indeed, as Zechariah and Matthew say, that he comes humble and riding on a donkey. And that's absolutely true. This is a reflection of Jesus's own humility and the kind of humility that, the, that God would have the kings of Israel uh, live into, embody, though they certainly don't always do that. And so the king is supposed to come in on a donkey. But make no mistake, this is absolutely a claim to kingship. It's a claim to being the rightful leader of Israel. 
And so as Jesus enters into Jerusalem or Zion, right? Zion is another name for Jerusalem. Um, it's, it is a threat to anyone who's in power and thinks that they are the one in charge of Jerusalem. It is a claim, a claim to kingship. It's a claim to leadership. And Jesus will describe himself as the Lord. He enters as the king. And so all of these descriptions about him as the son of David, like the rightful heir to David, um, uh, are all true and accurate. More than that, the way that Jesus enters into Jerusalem calls upon this mystery too. It was later in the prophecy of Zechariah, uh, in Zechariah 14, we're given this image of what this sort of vindicating, uh, or what this vindication of Jerusalem of Israel will be like. And there in Zechariah, it's not just the king that's coming, it's God himself who will redeem God's people, right? And this is, this is how Zechariah reads. This is chapter 14, beginning with verse 4. And remember, the scene here, Jesus has started this entry from the Mount of Olives, which is this like ridge, this like mountain ridge line that runs to the east of Jerusalem, right? So sort of north and south, east of Jerusalem. This is how Zechariah reads, and the prophecy that Jesus is calling on as he enters into Jerusalem in this way. On that day, his feet, right? This is the Lord, right? Actually, let me take it back one. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights, against, uh, as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west uh, by a very wide valley, so that on one half of the mount shall withdraw, so that one half of the mount shall withdraw northward, and the other half southward. And you shall flee by the valley of the Lord's mountain, for the valley between the mountains shall reach to Azal. And you shall flee as you flee from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, King Uzziah of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. In Zechariah, the vision is that God will come and save and rescue his people. He does so by standing on the Mount of Olives, and they flee out to him for protection. When Jesus begins his journey right, into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, that's on purpose. He's calling on this prophetic mystery of how God will save his people. And so he's performing the thing that not only the king does, but that God himself will do to save his people. Who has done this? Who is this? It's the one who has promised to save Israel, entering into Israel. But if you're on the ground that day, you might have some of these things swirling in the back of your mind, but you may have never seen Jesus before. And so who is this? Who is this unexpected person from Nazareth and Galilee, we're down in Jerusalem where this is happening. Jerusalem is sort of the power center. It's where the king used to reign, right? It's the big city. It's where the temple, uh, it's where the temple is. Galilee is up north. Galilee is sort of in the backwoods, right? Um, that's not the power center. Jesus is from there. And he's coming down into Jerusalem. And so the crowd that's gathering there, there's certainly been a crowd that's following him around, but many of these people are new. And they're seeing him do these things, and perhaps they, they're, they're like, oh, that's the thing from Zechariah. But they want to know, who is this guy doing those things? And you can imagine the rumors starting to swirl around. That's Jesus of Nazareth. From, from in Galilee. He's from up there. That's who it is who's coming to do these things. It's in, it's, it points us to how it is that Jesus comes and saves us. Yes, humble, taking on human form, as we'll say uh, together later. Uh, God who Im takes on a human body, who is incarnate with us, who is fully human, and yet who has all of the power, and not only the power, but the very being of God behind him and in him and with him, fully God and fully human coming to save us. It might not seem like that when you look at him. It might seem like he's San Diego State, right? The unexpected uh, person coming out of, of nowhere. Um, but that's how God chooses to operate, with the unexpected, with the least of us, so that we can be brought into the kingdom of God together.
And then finally, there's this question of who Jesus is and who he knows himself to be. As Jesus goes into Jerusalem, right, all of this he's doing on purpose. He's revealing who he is. He's living into this identity that properly belongs to him. And as he goes into Jerusalem, he will tell a series of, well, the first thing he'll do is he'll go and cleanse the temple, and he'll say that you've made my father's house a, a, a den of robbers, right? Uh, my father's house. And then he'll tell a series of parables about uh, who he is, describing who he is, and then we, will know, we know what happens to Jesus next. He'll gather with his disciples on the night before he dies. He'll celebrate a meal with him, a meal that we will celebrate here in a few minutes. And then he'll be betrayed. And when Judas goes and betrays him, uh, it identifies Jesus as the man, the one. Right? And then he will go ultimately to his death. The ultimate proof of who this is, as Jesus, the God-man, is what he will do not only at the beginning of this week, but at the end of this week, carrying God's very being, God's very present, all the way, presence with us all the way to death on a cross. After we, uh, after I preach, and after we respond by reading from Philippians 2, we're going to read the passion story together, the story of Jesus' crucifixion. As we read that, the question that I hope is on your mind is, who is this? And what answers does that story give you about who this person is? Do we want to know what kingship looks like? What rule looks like? It looks like Jesus not only riding in triumphantly, but crucified. And yes, then to be raised up to new life uh, or into the resurrection and, and then ascending to the right hand of God. But true humanity, right, tr God, who God really is, who, what kingship really is, looks like that. It looks like God with us in that way. Friends, that's what we remember this week. We all ultimately have to deal with this question, who is this? In some ways, it's inescapable for us. Um, even people who want very little to do with Jesus, there's just something that we have to figure out about him. We have to answer those questions you see a little evidence of this. This almost always, it seems, happens in the spring where, like, you'll get, like, the, you'll see, like, the new Time magazine or Newsweek or whatever that'll say, like, who was Jesus really, right? Or this new document reveals X, Y, or Z. And those things are almost always not as much as they're made out to be. But there's just something compelling about that question. Um, the figure of Jesus sort of haunts over our our culture, right? Our whole life. There's no one who doesn't have, for at least, I say no one, but there's very few people who don't have at least some idea of what or who Jesus is. That's the question for each of us. What do we make of this person, of who this is? That's the question that we live into during Holy Week. As we enter in with Jerusalem, uh, enter Jerusalem with Jesus, and we hear people asking, who is this? Who is this Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee? It's the question that we'll take through the week to Monday, Thursday, as Jesus washes his disciples' feet and celebrates communion with him. And he'll say, this is my body and this is my blood. Who is this? Who it is, is God present with us and the bread and the wine. Jesus then on the cross, crucified, as we'll read to get today and again on Friday, who is this? One of the first questions that Pilate will ask Jesus is if he is the Messiah, who is this? And then we'll come back here next Sunday on Easter with the proclamation that he is risen. Who is this? That's who Jesus is. He comes to us humble and riding on a donkey, but yet as king and Lord over all, as the one who fulfills what the prophets have said, who does the things that God can do. And he does those things in a way that we would not have expected in our own imaginations. He does that through a meal with his people and by going to death on a cross only to be raised again. Who is this? This is Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee.
I pray that this is true for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our confession of faith this morning is taken from Philippians 2. If you will read with me responsibly. Responsibly. What's that word? Whatever that word is. Y'all know what I mean. And stand up, please. You know, sometimes those words get away. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father, amen. You can be seated as I pray for us as well. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our nature and to suffer death upon the cross giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share his resurrection through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Who is this? Hold that question in your mind uh, as you hear from Matthew 27. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused, the chief priests and elders, by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to him, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should we, I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. Then he asked, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, his blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to be crucified. As they went out, they come, came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled the man to carry his cross, 
And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what had taken place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. Who is this? Friends, let's uh, offer our gifts and ourselves to God in confession and thankfulness.
Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In love, you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, your love remained steadfast. You bid your faithful people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Easter feast, that renewed by your word and sacraments and fervent in prayer and works of justice and mercy, that we may come to the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those who love you. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to redeem the world. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in our likeness. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let's pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. I invite those who will help me to serve uh, to come forward. Um, and uh, as they come forward, let me give you some instructions. Uh, you can come as we, as we sing, as you feel led. Uh, we'll have two stations on either, on either side of the table here. Uh, you can receive the bread and we'll uh, give you the cup. Um, there are receptacles for the cup on either side, just there on those little stands right there. You can place the cup. Uh, right there after you've received. Uh, this is the Lord's table, and all of those who uh, repent of their sins and seek to belong to Jesus, who um, seek to, to answer the question, who is this, uh, by saying that Jesus is Lord, are welcome to come to Christ's table. Um, if you have, are hearing that call today and have not yet received the gift of, of baptism, 
being incorporated into the body of Christ. I want you to know that you are invited to that as well. And hearing the call to the table is also to hear the call to the waters of baptism. And if that's you, uh, Fawn or I would love to talk to you after the service. Um, after you've received, feel free to, to pray. We have kneelers all around the room. You can go there and pray as long as you'd like. Of course, you can pray at your seat uh, as well. But we invite you uh, to do that as we, um, as we go to the Lord's table together. God leads you.
pray together. Oh, our most holy God, we thank you, God, for this mystery. We thank you for the birth and the death and the resurrection of your son, Jesus, God, so that we can spend eternity with you. God, when we leave this place, may we know what a gift we've been given to get today just because you love us, God, not for anything we've done. You're a good God, and we are grateful. In Christ's name, amen. Friends, may you go in peace. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.